So, good morning and welcome to the first of this week's virtual bridge sessions. We have now well over 50 sessions that are all available to view online and you may very well be watching this on YouTube. So today we have Steve Baxter and Rebecca Rumble of Dumfries and Galloway College and this is all about the virtual open week. So uh, this year's open week is going to be uh, virtual by necessity. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting time for us all and uh, Steve and Rebecca are going to take us through the preparation and testing and apparently a sprinkle of magic that has made this a successful experience for all involved. So if I can pass over to Steve and Rebecca. Hi, thanks very much. I'm just going to uh, share my presentation here if I can. So hi everyone, I'm Steve Baxter. I'm from Dumfries and Galloway College. I work in the IS department as a programmer, but recently we've done more and more video work as well. And uh, we're gonna talk about the virtual open week that we ran back in May. That was obviously a necessity. We couldn't invite anyone into the building and the open weeks are normally such a big part of the college year that the marketing uh, department had come up with the idea of doing this virtually. I think quite a lot of institutions had done the same. So I'm just going to cover the streaming part of the virtual open week. Rebecca actually did the web side of it. And uh, the organizing team behind the virtual open week actually did all of the, the hard work, which was scheduling the herd and cats, which was getting all the lecturers together to be interviewed at the right time and stuff like that. Um, so what happened in the end was over the course of the week, we had about 500 views of the, of the live sessions, which we're really surprised at. It was busier on the first couple of days, I think, because all the staff were probably fascinated and diving in to see what was going on. And then towards the end of the week, you were getting people who are genuinely interested in the, the topics of the day. So uh, is, are you've got the next slide now, yeah. So the, the preparation work was the, obviously the biggest part of the, the whole thing. The, the actual streaming, the, the thing happening itself wasn't really that difficult, but the, the prep work was massive, uh, as you can imagine. The first thing I did when I was approached to do this was to try and find the right kind of software. I used, used several pieces of software before, and I, I wanted to keep it really, really easy because for technical reasons, I was going to have to be the host. And that's not, that wasn't a nice situation for me because I'm not really a natural presenter. I'm not a radio, I'm not a radio person or anything like that. So uh, I first of all decided on the stream format. And uh, as you can imagine, there was video files flying at me from left, right and center. Can we show this? Can we show that? And all of these videos come in all different shapes and sizes. People have shot them vertically on their phones, horizontally, all different frame rates and everything. So the first thing I did was make sure all of the videos matched the stream frame rate and resolution. And I just used DaVinci Resolve to do that. Every single video got converted into 720p25. And I chose that resolution and frame rate because if you, if you say, oh, 1080p would be better, why don't we stream in 1080p? But it's four times the amount of data bearing in mind that we're going to be streaming from our own homes. Uh, I didn't really want to take a big chance with the internet connection. Sorry, my phone's ringing. You can, you can cut this bit out, yeah. Right, it stopped, good. Now it started again. Can you hear that phone ringing? Leave it, all right. I'll carry on. So, so all the videos were re-edited, which are going to be played through the virtual open week. And any copyrighted music which was in those videos that were sent to me, uh, that had to be replaced. I got some uh, TikTok videos from hairdressers, for instance, but they'd put on their favorite chart song. And uh, the, thing, the thing is, if you play copyrighted music in your stream, it might actually be unavailable to view in your country immediately. So if somebody comes in halfway through the stream and 20 minutes ago you played a chart song, it might say this stream isn't available in this country. So that, that was a really uh, carefully thought out thing. It's just not worth the trouble of trying to play your favorite song in the stream. I've had, uh, I streamed a, 
an ice skating event and all the routines were full of chart songs and it took three days to process some of the videos on YouTube because there were there weren't copyright strikes but it, it wasn't available anywhere in the world and you have to tell YouTube silence this video at this time and this time and the videos were six hours long so it was absolutely horrible um, but it, so that beyond that getting assets to actually play in your stream like this this backdrop you can see on the left here was the sort of main title screen i didn't have any of that stuff so i had to go to marketing to make sure i had it we had to make up a boilerplate script because there was no way i was going to add lib a week's worth of live stuff not being a radio personality so uh, i'll i'll come to that later on uh, we also interviewed all the staff over Skype. And the reason I use Skype is that the Ecamm Live software that we use recognizes Skype as a video source. I'll, I'll show you that later on, that's quite handy. So then designing all, all your holding screens and everything obviously takes a bit of time. And then testing your stream, actually testing streaming live to make sure that when the day comes and you, you go live, it's all gonna do what you expect. So this was the view that I had for most of that virtual open week. Uh, we used Ecamm Live. There's countless streaming systems available. Uh, I chose Ecamm Live because it's it's really the, the simplest one to use. You, you've got OBS and things like that, but I always find that's a bit more complicated. Uh, Ecamm Live's got really nice Skype integration, as I say. You can actually have Skype running on a different computer in your network and it will show up as a video source in Ecamm Live. Uh, it uses this thing called NDI. Um, so Ecamm Live also handles the kind of the YouTube key. You know, you get a streaming key, you have to go to YouTube Studio, you see, right, you're good to go and everything. You don't even have to do that in Ecamm Live. You just hit the Go Live button. Uh, and the way we had to embed the stream in the website, which Rebecca will talk about later, uh, she picks up live events as they happen on a channel, but I, I didn't have to worry about any live streaming keys or anything. So on the desk there, what have we got? We've got a Mac running Ecamm Live uh, and, and Skype, I actually run them both on the same machine. You can have Skype on a different desktop. So this headset that I'm wearing right now is the one that I used all week. And the reason for that is that if I'm looking around, the microphone's still in the right place. I thought about using a nice podcasting microphone and when I actually had a wee rehearsal, I couldn't see my screen past it. And then if I needed to do something on another desktop, I was talking away from it. So not being really experienced at talking in mic proximity, I, I just went for a simple office type headset. Uh, there's an MP3 player down at the bottom left there. And when I switched that on, ambient music would play and that was really great for doing the countdowns and things like that. I didn't have to worry about playlisting anything in the software. I just turned on the MP3 player and ambient music was playing. And just make sure your mic's muted and Skype's muted and, and you're good to go. So I've got something called a, a Camlink 4K. It's circled in green there because it's so small. And what that does is takes any HDMI source and, and presents it to your computer as a webcam. So it's really, really handy thing to, to have. So Ecamm Live looks for a webcam input and all you do is tell it, yeah, use the cam link. And I've got a Sony FS100 camera, a cinema camera plugged into the cam link so that the, the output's pretty good. And then down the bottom there, there's a, a Stream Deck Mini. You can see it next to the iPad with the little colored buttons. There's a close up of that later. The all important iPad because I was getting prompts all the time during the open week from the team behind it because although I was running the stream, all of the information that I got was coming from the, there's a virtual open week team on Teams. So that's how that worked. So this is the the main Ecamm screen. And it's, sorry, it's a bit blurry, but I was messing around trying to redact some Skype addresses and, uh, and I ended up saving it really badly. So at the bottom left, there's a list of scenes there. And the really nice thing in Ecamm Live is if you have a playlist of videos, you can set an action to the end of a video 
So you can say, play this video. When it ends, play this video. And when that ends, go back to the holding screen for today. Just takes all this pressure away from you. In OBS, you would, you would probably have to either write some scripts or manually select these scenes. And I, I didn't fancy that too much because there's enough pressure already. At the top right, there's a shared Office 365 document, which is my, my script for the day. So the virtual open week team can actually make changes to that script uh, whilst, whilst I'm on and I won't see them till I get there. That, that was a really great thing to have because at go live time, you can see the red right in there is just giving me cues, countdown, play VT, principal, unmute your microphone and say this. So it was pretty much uh, step by step what I have to do to get the, the stream out. And as I've got at the bottom here, you can see uh, there's a Skype window just tucked underneath. And that's my guest is waiting in Skype on another desktop and I've got Skype muted. So I can actually sit and chat to him whilst the countdown music's playing and ask him what he's going to talk about. Then below the script at the bottom right, I've got a canned set of interview questions, just ones that I ask to everyone. Um, tell us a bit about yourself and your department and things like that. And it was really important to have all this stuff in front of me so that I would remember to do it. Uh, and I also kept the Skype addresses in that window as well, which is why I've made a terrible job of blurring it out. Ecamm Live's also got a built-in countdown timer that you can just place on the screen. So I would always hit go. I think if I show the stream deck here, the, yeah. So virtual open week button at the top right, if I press that, it switches to that picture and a countdown timer starts from 10 minutes. So I push that button and then I switch on my MP3 player and everyone who's tuning in knows the, the virtual open week's about to start. And uh, on the top left button, I can press that and it will go to the holding screen for the day with my mic open so I can speak. Uh, at the bottom left, the show hide pip button actually just shows and hides my camera in the bottom left of the screen. That's useful if you're just showing a schedule, you're gonna go away for a cup of tea, mute your mic, turn off your camera and get on with it. And in the top middle, I can easily switch the screen over to Skype. So Skype takes over full screen. Your guests can either be side by side split or you can, like at the moment, there's, there's three people in this call. There's me and two other people. So the main window is audio only. And I had another guest on by video. And these Skype pre-records that we did, uh, every single interview that I was going to do in the virtual open week, I did the week before. And I think only on one occasion, someone's microphone wasn't working just seconds before we were going to go live. And I said, um, I can't get through to Maggie right now, but I spoke to her last week about her department. Let's see what she had to say. And I played the pre-record out. And by the end of the pre-record, I'd got her back on Skype for a Q&A even though it was only audio. So it was really, really important to have these backups. Uh, the other backup I had was incredibly a completely separate Mac running the entire virtual open week. Because we, were, we didn't have access to our, because this isn't really so crucial now that we can get back into our campus to some extent. But when you're at home, if BT put a digger shovel down through your phone line, the virtual open week's over. <laughs> So I had a completely separate system and you can actually see there's a redundant 4G rack there, which I hired in for the week. So it was actually faster than my home internet connection, 30 megabit internet connection in that rack, wireless. So we'll be able to be back up in a few minutes if everything went wrong. Um, so that's that's really all I've got to say about what I did. It was It was really just a technical talk, mine. Uh, the, the organization and stuff is more the, the marketing department could tell you how they managed to do that. I wouldn't like that job. But uh, so Rebecca might want to explain how her web script actually picks up my, my stream. So if I can advance my slide here and uh, mute myself. Right, one, two, three.
um, um, uh, Rebecca Rumble, um, assistant, assistant web developer at uh, the Bruce Valley College. Um, so the so the web page script. Um, I basically only had a couple of weeks to put this together. Um, so it was literally just thrown together um, with information that marketing sent across to me. Um, and I, was, I wasn't quite sure how to embed the YouTube channel initially. Um, so I did a, a mad Google search um, and found, out, found this conversation um, about embedding live YouTube feeds. And so the an actual class script I wrote for this, which was in PHP, um, was based on that discussion. And um, what it actually does is that it looks at the channel ID. You need to put a YouTube channel ID for it to look at. And it looks to see if there's a current live feed. If there is a live feed, it loads it up. Um, but if there isn't one, it's displaying fallback video, which is just uh, an advert for the Pusicella College and a schedule. Um, I also put a bit of JavaScript in there, which had a little countdown to the next event. And I also put a little bit in um, so that it refreshed the feed once that countdown hit zero. I did discover when I was testing that the there was a wee bit of a delay between the JavaScript hitting zero and the live feed coming on, but we that was that was easily sorted by the fact that we had a countdown on the live feed anyway. So the live feed was actually starting 15 minutes before the event. Um, I'm just thinking. Uh, I think it's it's worth mentioning yeah. there that, that YouTube does take a, oh, yeah. a, maybe a minute to to pick up the stream anyway. If you look in mm -hmm. YouTube Studio, it does take a while to appear. So it may be that your script was working fine. Mm -hmm. um, going back to YouTube as well, um, we discovered when we were testing that you need to have a certain number of subscribers and be eligible for the YouTube Partner Program in order to be able to embed YouTube feeds on the websites, which Luckily, we had a channel. Well, Steve had a channel that he could use for that. Um, otherwise, that might have put a slight like damper on it. <laughs> um, and we've since discovered, uh, well, Steve's since discovered a few um, more stream uh, services that we could have used to stream on multiple, multiple platforms, um, which hopefully we'll maybe have a play with in the future. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything else. Well, just to go through, yeah, obviously we discovered that um, Restream.io service, and you have to pay for it, but the great thing about that is you can add Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook all as uh, endpoints, and then when you go live, it goes live to all of them at once, and you can embed that video stream your YouTube video stream can be embedded in obviously other websites because it's not coming straight from YouTube. It was a bit of a last minute panic. I think the day, maybe the Friday before the Monday, we discovered that we were not allowed to embed the Dumfries and Galloway College YouTube channel uh, mm -hmm. uh, into our, our dumbgal.ac.uk webpage. So I, I switched to, over to a channel that we have that basically for these events that we live stream it's got a lot of subscribers it's not people who check in with us every week to see what cool things we've made it's people who might connect to our channel once a year like two three thousand four thousand people who might go uh, to watch these skating events so it's just lucky we had that and it, it worked fine you have to have it forty thousand views a year i think or something like that to be able to embed in your own page and we didn't know that at the time so what I've put in some, uh, oh, sorry, Rebecca. Oh, that's okay. I was just noticing this question in the chat. Um, uh, whether we were planning to do any future virtual open days, which we do actually have. Well, it's not really quite the same as the open week, but we do have a day in August 
where we're going to just rerun all the videos that we did in, in May. And I think the plan is to do another virtual open week uh, next year. And my plan is to find someone to host it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> So we've got uh, on this resource page, it's just links to everything that, that was used for the open week, if, if it's any good to anyone. And there's actually a link to the open day website because all, all the playbacks are still there. You can go back and look over them all. We kept the same formula every day. So we would do a countdown, then play a welcome from the principal. And then I would say, hi, everyone, welcome to the virtual open week. And then I would have a guest. And then there'd be a playlist of videos. And then we'd basically do that again in the afternoon with a different guest. And that was how we managed to keep it a kind of stable, we know what's going to happen. The only, the only random element is the guest and everybody's internet connections and everybody's understanding of their, their mics and, and webcams and everything. So that's us. Excellent. Thank you so much. That was really good, Stephen, Rebecca. Thank you for that. Um, I can see a couple of comments in the chat. Kenji has made your kit envy. Kenji does like his, uh, his kit. So in terms of kit, is there one thing that you would have bought uh, that you didn't have access to if you were going to do this again? Uh, I would have bought a Blackmagic A10 Mini Pro. Because with that now, with the Blackmagic control software, you can put in a YouTube streaming key mm -hmm. and you can hit on air and you're streaming. Oh. Incredible. So then you, you can have another computer plugged in that's got all of your graphics and your playlists and everything. So that, that's one thing that I would, I would have killed for at the time. But uh, I think e Ecamm as a sort of software solution was enough. Because we weren't using multiple cameras. It was just one camera on me. There was guests coming in and there was videos to play. Okay. And coming away from the kit, is there anything that you were doing by day five that you weren't doing in day one? Any lessons learned throughout the week that made you smarter or slicker? Not sure. I can't think of anything really because it was all kind of boilerplated for me. Mm -hmm. Uh, I made sure that the script was much the same every day with just these e extra elements and uh, I, I don't think I did anything differently towards the end. I, I stopped paying any attention to the backup by the end of the week. So I was updating the backup rigorously on Monday and Tuesday night to make mm -hmm. sure that every single video was in there that, that was supposed to be, but by Wednesday I was going, oh, the internet connection's fine, I've not even looked at the backup. so. Now that we can actually get access to the campus to do this, I don't think that would be an issue anyway, because we've got redundant internet connections. Mm -hmm. Is there any thoughts if, you know, if there is a second wave or something, could you take this into online induction as well? I think Rebecca's best place to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're actually working on our online induction at the moment. <laughs> okay. Um, but, <laughs> yeah. um, I don't. I think what they're. I think what they're planning to do is uh, having um, induction meetings on um, uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, oh. We're putting all the. We're basically creating a little Moodle course um, for our induction, just to take take students through um, what's a, what support is available in the college and things like that. So we're putting that together at the moment, and the link should go out in a couple of weeks. I think. Um, I see Alan W has been saying a fair bit in the chat there. I don't know, Alan, if you want to come in and unmute the mic. I don't know if you're in a position to do so. No worries, of course, if not. Or if anyone else wants to, to come in and ask any questions. Alan, I can see that you're, you've unmuted, but we can't hear anything if you're speaking.
No, Alan, I can see you have come off on mute, but we're not hearing any volume there. So um, you can see in the chat what Alan was saying regarding how impressive it is, and you've obviously got the, the backing and the funding to get to get the kit right. Uh, and also mentioning one of our, pre our previous presentations, which was about the content of presentations. So anyone watching this and that's enjoyed this technical view, if you want to go and get some tips on the content side of things, uh, last week's presentations by Esther Barrett might be something that you want to look at. Kenji, I can see you've come off on mute. Um, so, like, I I like the idea of of having those shows. And like, you you said, did you say there was about five hundred people came in to the virtual open week over that oh, course of time? Over the course of the week, it was over five hundred views. Yeah, it was more a, more as I say at the beginning of the week, it tailed off towards the end. Do you get a notion that um, it's easier for people to engage with a format like that just because of distance? Um, Typically, how many people come to uh, an open day at Dumfries, Dumfries and Galloway uh, in a regular sort of non-COVID type year? Yeah, that's a discussion we had. We actually think there was less people coming in person than than we had on the virtual one. But I think it wouldn't suit everyone. I think some people want to get in and actually see what's there and touch the the joinery equipment and whatever. You're not getting that. You're not getting that through the web. And I could see, like, so you've got recorded sessions. And I saw, Rebecca, you had the, there was a box where you were encouraging people to post via Twitter questions, etc. Mm -hmm. So obviously you've got a slight mismatch in the sense that if you've got recorded sessions, then if somebody has a specific question to one of the live, one of the presenters or some of the, they, they see talking, which looks like a, like a, a real time kind of interview, um, then you're not able to respond to immediate questions. Did do you see any way around that? Or is there anything you would do different if you were to do it again? Um, well, the actual, the one we had in May, um, it, the sessions were actually live and we were feeding questions to Steve to, to ask to the people speaking. Yeah, the, the pre-record, I might have not been clear about that. The pre-records were done the week before as a backup, just oh, okay. in case we couldn't talk to someone on the day because we could say, oh, you know, we're now going to talk to Alan from construction, but Alan's electric's off. So I spoke to him last week. Let's see what he had to say. So we had pre-recorded everything, but we had planned to do it live. So we did do it live, but we had these as a backup. Which I, I, came in useful a couple of times. <laughs> that's, that's such a professional take. Um, <laughs> that's so, like, just thinking ahead. Um, so with the, what, what's a good length of time for a live interview? Do you ever get to, the, to like, what, what's an ideal length of time? Is it, is it 20 minutes? Is it 40 minutes? Should it be an hour? What's, what, what, what seemed to work best? I think it's the 15 to 20 minutes is fine. <laughs> yeah. If it's a long form interview, it would be about something a bit more involved. You're you're talking to a curriculum manager about their area, the courses they provide, and uh, what equipment they've got, and things like that. And when you've covered that, you, you after that you're on to questions. Like with the setup that you have as well, it seems to like open up the possibility to do things like student shows, student showcases, showcasing the work. Like you've you've got a really slick. Um, well put together format and like your equipment, your backup, all of those would suggest that, you know, it'd be a shame not to use this for other stuff. So have you started thinking about what other sort of areas you might be able to use this with? Well, interestingly, we're actually currently specking a, a live streaming studio for the, for the college. I don't know if Callum's on this call, but if, if he is, he can talk a bit more about that. But we've been putting together a room which is uh, obviously got to be quite easy to use so it, it would be a room where you can go in cameras already set up there's a preview of what the cameras are doing there's good microphones that and you just need a wee bit of training how to use it you can hit record and it'll go onto a usb stick that you can take away with you or you can hit on here and go live on youtube uh, so we're we're gonna we're gonna put that together at some point because we just saw that, that this is going to happen more and more you know the, the sort of the success of this is not just purely COVID, it's the fact that this is a really useful thing to have anyway. 
Yeah, yeah um, I, was, I was just come in there because um, <clears throat> this this uh, the idea of this production suite it's going to um, sort of be able to enhance our online delivery so that um, staff could come in, record sessions, demonstrations, things like that that we can then upload into our VLE and be part of our um, sort of online delivery. Um, <clears throat> The production suite came about because we're like a lot of places we're going through like um, this digital transformation um, and the, the, we're, we're looking at things like digital classrooms and online delivery that way and then obviously we thought well if we can't do a, a live demonstration how do we how do we capture all that stuff so that's where the, uh, the the production suite idea came from and obviously Steve and Rebecca with their their, their expertise have been sort of instrumental in guiding how we're we're, we're shaping it. Excellent. Thank you, Council. I think we're getting up to the half an hour spot, so we might take this as a, just an opportunity to say to everyone that's watching this in the stream, thank you very much for watching. There's lots of more videos and we'll hopefully see you at a virtual bridge soon. Uh, but for the rest of us, we can stay on and chat if there's any further questions or anything that we, we want to talk about just now.